Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you can hear me. I can hear that the microphone is working, which is always very reassuring. Um, now, before we start, um, and I should first of all say that I'm Ian Blatchford, not Steve Jones, um, there are some, just some housekeeping uh, things to remind you of. So uh, if mobile phones could be turned off or, or in silent mode, um, there are no planned fire evacuations this evening. So in the event of a fire alarm going off, please can you evacuate by the fire exit doors. Um, the event is being video recorded, and so it will be available online after the event. And there will also be uh, on the screen speech to text. So, um, well, welcome. And I thought I would start by um, explaining why I was so keen to do this event. As you can imagine, as director of the Science M Museum, I receive an enormous number of books. Um, and uh, it's impossible to read them all. Uh, but the moment Steve's book arrived, I thought, gosh, I, this is going to be fascinating. Uh, and there are th two reasons for that. The first um, is the writer himself. Uh, as you know, an incredibly distinguished geneticist, senior research fellow at UCL, fellow of the Royal Society, um, Reith lecturer on genes in 1991. And of course, many of you will also know uh, wrote an incredibly important report on BBC Science Reporting in 2011, which was a very major event in terms of uh, the vexed question of balance. But he just let slip um, before something of absolutely cosmic importance as part of his CV, which uh, I think we should, in fact, talk about the entire evening and forget the current book, because he's about to publish the Ladybird Book of Evolution. Um, and I'm sure we can all agree there are a number of candidates in a certain election <laughs> taking place today that maybe would benefit from the Lady Bear book of, uh, uh, of evolution. So certainly, unfortunately, it's out in January, but um, it would be a New Year treat for all of us. Um, but the second reason I was so keen to do this event is, is for some rather strange reasons. So some of you might know I'm in the rather odd position of being director of the Science Museum but not the scientist. I'm an art historian. And so this picture behind me of Lavoisier and his wife is a picture that art historians encounter very often in their, their art history. And, and very often it's by David, and David is an incredibly important painter, both of pre-revolutionary and post-revolutionary France. And you know, when I first encountered this picture years ago, I was told, here is a very fr famous French scientist who, uh, it's a wonderful picture, and by the way, he died in the revolution. Uh, and so uh, you can imagine my slight embarrassment when I finally became director of the Science Museum and went to La Musée des Arts and Métiers in Paris and suddenly realized that to describe Lavoisier as a quite important French scientist is a slight understatement because, of course, uh, unfortunately, um, Martin Polyakov, who I was talking to earlier this evening, is not here because he would be horrified to realize that of course, for most arts people, they have absolutely no idea who this man is. And yet here is the great founder of, of modern chemistry. Um, I think uh, the subject also interests me because if you think of a lot of popular discussion about the French Revolution and, and the, the uh, lead up to it, it's very much dominated not by a scientific story. Um, the thing I often quote is um, Antonia Fraser's very famous biography of Marie Antoinette, which, by the way, is a wonderful book. But if you think about uh, a lot of dialogue in terms of popular television, uh, another discussion, it's very much about you know, the French court, Marie Antoinette, about diamond necklaces, about who was having an affair with whom. Uh, and there's a whole other story. And I say that with some interest, because I was saying to Steve earlier, one of the things that um, we're working on at the Science Museum is to bring to London a really fantastic exhibition that was at Versailles back in 2010, which is all about the great scientific endeavors taking place at Versailles, a rather surprising story. But of course, the, the moment you look into it, you discover that uh, great scientists working personally for the king or coming from Paris to demonstrate the latest breakthroughs in chemistry and physics and engineering, uh, and uh, you know, a great story. Um, the other thing also that we might uh, touch on later is, is thinking about the degree to which uh, great French scientists were or were not in dialogue with their English counterparts. Um, but I was going to st st start, Steve, with, with, with um, some rather basic questions, which um, are, are the most obvious is, is to start with, which is why this appealed to you as a subject. 
Well, um, partly because I'm sort of interested in science and science history, um, and I knew quite a lot about Lamarck uh, because, uh, you know, if you're a geneticist, you have to spit every time you say the word Lamarck. <laughs> Um, and uh, I thought I'd build on that, but I had a, a, I had a less noble um, uh, motive, really. My, my various books, not yet including the Ladybird Book of Evolution, have been translated into various languages, but never into French. <coughs> and I spent a lot of time in France, and my French neighbors said, oh, well, I mean, they shouldn't be translated into French. And I suddenly thought I could write a book about French science. So I started looking into it, and I was quite astounded, first of all, by the extraordinary breadth of what was going on at the time of the revolution. And also, almost unknown to me, uh, the fact that the scientists, people who are remembered to be as being major scientific figures, people like Lamarck, shall we say, or people like Lavoisier, um, people like Benjamin Franklin, who was in Paris at the time, or just before the revolution. Um, they, were, they, they, were, they were major scientists, but they were also extremely active in the process of revolution. And many of the French people, the French side of that, of, uh, of, of that movement, felt that the revolution was a scientific inevitability. There was a, uh, there was a, there was a, a physiologist, somebody who worked on eyes, called Desdut de Tracy. And uh, he wrote a sentence which really echoes the atmosphere in Paris at that time. Uh, he invented the word ideology. And he came out with a phrase that ideology is part of zoology. Okay? In other words, humans, men and women, um, are programmed to have ideas and they will progress. And it's interesting because Lamarck comes into that because Lamarck came up with the idea of what he called necessary progress. And we all know about um, uh, giraffes, necks, and leaves. He scarcely mentions that. He, they, <coughs> the, case, <coughs> the case he mentions more he used to talk about uh, birds landing in uh, next to the uh, next to a lake. Some of them wade in. They find this is good, so the next generation can wade in a bit further and wade in a bit further. Because somewhere in the mind of those birds is the idea that they need to progress into a new habitat. Now Darwin was very kind about Lamarck in the origin. He says he is the he was the first person to uh, realize that animals and plants can change. And if you go to the Jardin des Plantes in Paris, there's an enormous statue which is which is uh, which is um, uh, dedicated to the founder of evolution, to the founder of evolutionary theory. And I thought that's funny. It doesn't look like Charles Darwin. <laughs> of course, of course, it's Lamarck. But actually, Lamarck did have the idea that things could change, but for completely the wrong idea that they wanted to change, that it was inevitable. And Darwin, who was, I think, a very kind and generous man, um, was absolutely poisonous about Lamarck in his, in, his, um, in his private writings, letters to people. He just called his ideas nonsense. The idea of progress is absurd. And that's the big difference, really, between the two sides of the channel. There are almost no cases in Britain of scientists becoming involved in politics for scientific reasons. There are one or two notorious expe excep exceptions. There's Margaret Roberts, whatever became of her. Um, um, and, she did, and she did and did not finish, I should tell you. Uh, she started a PhD in the subject, actually, which my, fa my father was a scientist, and he was an expert on surface chemistry and physics. Um, the, uh, his name is on the, uh, he, he's the patentee of GIF, you know, that's the cleaning plant uh, uh, stuff. And Mrs. Thatcher did that. She worked on saponification, which is the, uh, adding powerful alkalis to, uh, to oily substances to make soft soap. Very appropriate for a politician, in fact. Um, <laughs> but um, she never really used that in her, apart from the soft soap, no, she never used any hard soft soap. It was always hard detergent to her. Um, she never used that to rationalize her political views. But in, pa in France, that was very, very common. And it really, it, it continued, it was there before the revolution, it's there, in some sense, it's still there now. And I really have no idea why that is. But that's what I learned most of all, I think, when I was writing that book. Well, can I ask you about that? Because the thing that um, fascinated me is my immediate predecessor uh, is now a colleague of yours at UCL, Chris Rapley, yeah. who, as you know, is a very distinguished uh, environmental scientist. And, and, and Chris used to speak very eloquently about the difficulty for a scientist like him, which is you do the science, and then people say, and what are the political solutions? And he used to feel very wary of scientists being dragged in, dragged from the science into the political uh, solutions. But it seems to me that, and I've just chosen three characters from many in your book, that actually you know, your scientific uh, forebears in France took the opposite view that um, you know, the sheer number of scientists who were very, very active parts of the revolution and the, and the new thinking. 
Yes, that's true. I mean, uh, there's a famous, another painting by David, which is about the, uh, the Tennis Court Oath. And the Tennis Court Oath took place at the end of a long, long period in which Louis XVI, who I think meant well, except that, except that his, uh, the system of government was you know, rather like ours, was completely ineffective and out of its time. Um, and he brought a great gathering of the great and the good into to, to Versailles, um, and uh, later into Paris, actually, um, to try and sort out how they were going to clear up this mess. And it went nowhere. There were the famous, th the, the, the famous three estates, the church, the aristocracy, and the people, all of which had the same uh, representation. So, of course, the church and the aristocracy could always get together and defeat the will of the people. And uh, the tennis court oath, and as you heard the poem, there's a tennis court, um, is a painting by, 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 by David, a very busy painting with a very distinguished figure standing upright with his, uh, with his hand up, pro pro proclaiming the the French Revolution. And who was that? It was Bailly, uh, who was an astronomer, who was interested in the transit of Venus, of Venus and wrote extensively, actually, on, on the ancient Egyptians and their philosophy of science. And he became, he pulled people into the Jeu de Pomme, declared that they were the government, or they were going to advise the government. Uh, he became mayor of Paris, um, and within a year he was guillotined. And that happened to a lot of them. And some of the others, like Fourcroy, who was a chemist, um, he kept he was very careful. An awful lot of them kind of disappeared during the revolution, and then they came back. And in fact, the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the premier, the prime minister of France, who was a, a scientist after the revolution, was Arago. And Arago was a great geographer and surveyor who did an awful lot to, set, to work on the meter and the map of France. And he came back and reached the very highest political points. And that, again, is quite different from the British experience. I always like Churchill's statement about science. Mm. Scientists should be on tap and not on top. And I think he was right. But I get the impression that Fulcroy was, um, uh, to use a phrase I think I've heard you use before, the, the sort of vicar of Bray character. I mean, it very much a survivor. I mean, he's quite a controversial figure in some ways, isn't he? Because uh, later on in his life, a lot of scientific papers have his name on it, yeah. even though he couldn't possibly have actually been working on them. And, well, and he became a sort of great administrator of the French. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, have to, I have to say that phenomenon is not unknown in these British Isles of ours. Um, <laughs> And in fact, we're told to do it. I mean, I've had various PhD students, and I never put my name on their papers. Uh, but now you have to, otherwise the papers don't count. So we're, you know, we're all four crows under the skin nowadays. Um, yes, that's true. That's true. Um, and uh, <coughs> yes, I mean, the interesting thing is how, as we've said, how intimately the um, the two sides, science and politics, were bound up. We've talked about Lavoisier, and I think Lavoisier is probably the greatest of them all because he, he, he is to chemistry what Newton was to physics and what Darwin was to biology. He was the first person to turn chemistry into a quantitative science. And he, ha he had a, a famous um, experiment, which he did, uh, and he took a, a burning glass, an enormous burning glass, over three or four meters across, on a huge wooden chariot, and then that focused onto a second burning glass, and he rolled this enormous uh, contraption uh, up outside the Louvre. And at the, at the focal point of this uh, double uh, burning glass, he put a large diamond. And the, the fashionable crowd gathered around him to see what would happen. And to their complete astonishment, the diamond disappeared. It looked like magic. Well, wh what was it? It was chemistry. Because, of course, what had happened was the diamond is carbon. And one form of carbon, which is crystalline carbon, you, you can hit it with a hammer as hard as you like, and it, it'll just manage. But give it the right chemical environment, oxygen, and some heat, uh, a specified amount of heat, then you'd make a completely new chemical, which is carbon dioxide. And that, you know, that made all the rich, uh, uh, young, the rich ladies in their diamonds scuttle home at some speed. Um, but, um, you know, that was an astonishing thing for him to have done. He came out with the idea of simple substances, what we now call elements. And that was the foundation of the whole of chemistry. And he went further than that, because after having done that, and realized that uh, combustion was just carbon, oxygen, and heat, either heat in or heat out, um, he, he realized that actually uh, humans, men and women, are just machines. And he went on very quickly with the help of the great astronomer Laplace, because these people are all in it together, to start measuring the chemistry of human metabolism. There's a famous engraving 
of a, uh, a chap, a man in the iron mask, his name was Sega, uh, breathing in a qu measured quantity of oxygen, breathing out carbon dioxide, um, and then uh, there's Lavoisier doing the experiment. And behind him is a young lady who's his wife, uh, who's taking all the data. And uh, indeed, he made, he made Sega have a meal, and his metabolic rate, as we would say, went up. He made Sagan exercise um, and his metabolic on a sort of bicycle like apparatus, and the amount of oxygen uh, in and the amount of heat generated um, both went up, as did the carbon dioxide. He invented the calorimeter, that ice, an ice bath, uh, which you put a metal, uh, a metal um, container, and he put, what did he put in it? The first person to use a guinea pig. He put a guinea pig in it, measured the carbon dioxide and the oxygen, and measured the heat generated by measuring the rate of melting of the ice. Um, and, you know, it's, it's quite remarkable. And what's really remarkable, actually, is that what he did is still the foundation of modern ex physiology, exercise physiology most of all. And if you watch the um, end of the French, of the Tour de France, it always takes the same route. It goes down the Champs-Élysées, it goes around, and it ends up at the, at the Arc de Triomphe. Um, and that was the site. It goes past the site of Lavoisier's laboratory. And that was where the arsenal now is, the, where the uh, Canal Saint-Martin goes, goes into the Seine. That's where his laboratory was. And the, and, the, and the cyclists go past it madly, not realizing it, that, but all their training is based on what Lavoisier did. And actually, the Tour de France says more about Lavoisier because um, Tour de France, of course, has a uniquely uh, uh, French origin because it is and was a political gesture. It started in 1903. And it started at the time of the, um, of the great waves of anti-Semitism in France, where, uh, what was his name, the officer who was... The Dreyfus. Yeah, Dreyfus, yeah. the Dreyfus affair. And Dreyfus, was, who was a Jew, was accused of being a, a German spy, was stripped of his, uh, of his, uh, of his uh, rank and sent off to Devil's Island. And this caused an enormous row in France, a great shattering row in France. And famously, Emile Zola wrote a, a letter called J'accuse, uh, which finally got Dreyfus back. Um, but the, there, was a, there was a cycling magazine called Le Velo, and the owner of that was very keen on Dreyfus, but his main advertiser was uh, a, a passionate anti-Semite, so he withdrew all his advertising, and Le Velo went bust. And the owner, to ensure, uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, his advertiser, to ensure that it would never start again, started a, a new magazine called Lotto, the Auto. And he had a... He had a um, uh, a uh, selling point, which is a, a cycle race around France, okay? And the first stage, this is 1903, a terrible old rattly old bone shakers, and the uh, first stage in this race was from Paris to Lyon, non-stop, which is a long cycle ride, I can tell you. Um, and actually, in that first race, uh, something which actually um, uh, marked the Tour de France from then until now happened, somebody was found to be cheating. And they weren't, actually, they weren't actually using drugs, but they found this chap, and I have a picture of him, and he looks like a characteristic cheat. A cheat. He looks as if he's about to burgle your house. Uh, they, 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 they found a train ticket in his pocket. <laughs> <laughs> um, and that's, of course, continued. And famously, Lance Armstrong was a cheat. Uh, he won the tour seven times. Um, and what was he doing? He was using Lavoisier's uh, equation. In other words, he was pushing up the amount of oxygen he could take in uh, by, by virtue of increasing the number of red cells by taking drugs. Um, and so, you know, all this, that's what I liked about the book, the way it speaks to the modern time as much as it did to them. But you got in trouble with some people for that, didn't you? I mean, I mean, um, I mean what I love about the book is you take um, great French scientists and then describe an arc uh, in terms of the impact of their work in post-revolutionary France right up to the, uh, the modern age. I mean, one of, one of the... Um, the chapters I particularly love, where you talk about the fact that uh, one of the reasons that the new republic was able to, to survive is that with all its physicists and chemists and engineers, it could defend its borders with, you know, yeah. uh, new, new, uh, new ammunition and uh, munitions. And you, you, you talk about, you know, that, that uh, tradition following all the way up to Fritz Haber and, and, you know, the German effort in the First World War. But, but of course, a lot of science historians will hate the fact that you weren't chronological, Professor. They, they, they did. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. I mean, um, yes. Uh, well, I'm not a historian. I'm not a historian. I mean, I say proudly or with shame, I'm not a historian. Um, 
Yes, they, they did. Um, and it, Lavoisier was very much involved in practical stuff. He, he developed gunpowder, uh, the new, new forms of gunpowder, and he did it with chemistry. Before that, of course, gunpowder had just been done in an ad hoc kind of way. Um, and uh, it was in Waltham Abbey, actually, where British gunpowder was first made. And there were all kinds of rules. If you, were, if you, uh, uh, if you swore in the factory, um, you were immediately dismissed. And this is because this might attract God's wrath in the form of a thunderbolt, <laughs> um, which would cause it to blow up. Um, and in fact, uh, Lavoisier uh, uh, developed potassium chlorate as a, an explosive. And that's fine, but it's very unstable. And it did blow up, and it killed several people. And uh, where the, um, in the, in the, the Louvre, for example, the, uh, the, the, um, just outside the Louvre, there was a, there was a, pl a place for casting guns. Uh, the Notre Dame was used as a, a bronze foundry in, during, the, during the Revolutionary Wars. And this was all done by science. And that really allowed France to defend itself. But it seemed completely impossible that it could against the mass of the rest of Europe. It's interesting, actually. The biggest chemical factory in the world, um, then and now, is called, the du is called the Dupont Company. And who was Dupont? He was Dupont de Nemours, who was uh, active with, Le with uh, Lavoisier uh, at the time of the Revolution. Lavoisier was executed, and I might come back briefly yeah, to why that right was. There, yeah. uh, uh, Dupont fled to the United States, set up a chemical factory to make gunpowder in Wilmington and Delaware. And at that chemical factory, they make, you know, lycra, all these things, all of which come from the, uh, come from uh, an event in the French Revolution. Well, 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 let me go back to something you just referred to then, which is, um, if I was an Evo's advocate and looking at Lavoisier from the perspective of Marat or Robespierre, one could say there's a lot to be quite suspicious mm. of. Uh, and, and what's very striking in the book is, 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 is the following. A, how rich he was. B, where the money came from. And C, how he spent it. That's true. Lavoisier was extremely rich. Um, I mean, he had an enormous income of effectively several million pounds a year. Um, where did that come from? It came from a scheme that he became involved in, which, which was called the tax farm. And the tax farm is an idea that goes back to Roman times. In fact, the publicans in the temple, which Jesus threw out, um, they were tax farmers. and They bought the right to collect taxes. And what they would do, they would make a statement to the French uh, government that we will guarantee you, the French government want them to collect so many milliards of livres. And they would say, okay, we will pay you this large sum of money um, to collect these taxes for you. And any extra above the agreed sum, we will keep. Okay, and that was tax farming. And uh, Lavoisier was strongly involved in that, and he, he was one of 24 tax farmers, all of whom were executed. Uh, rather in brackets, that's where I get the title of my book from, um, because the tax farmers were dragged before the Revolutionary Tribunal in 17, uh, 90, 1793 um, and um, immediately condemned to death. To death. And a, a very brave guy at the back of the r r room shouted, you cannot kill that man, Lavoisier, because he is a genius. And the judge, who himself, I have to tell you, say, was executed six months later, uh, he said, the revolution has no need for geniuses. And that's the title of the book, No Need for Geniuses. And what uh, Lavoisier was very much involved, because he wasn't, he wasn't, he wasn't just an active, just a passive uh, administrator. Um, he was strongly involved in squeezing as much money as he possibly could out of the public. And one of the things he did was to build a wall around Paris. And one of the really unpopular taxes was called the octroi. And the octroi, which had been around for many centuries, was a tax that had to be paid on essential goods that went into cities, wine, soap, bread, bread most of all. Um, and they had to pay a tax. And of course, this tax, like VAT, uh, was much more um, he heavy on poor people because that they had to buy the stuff, and it was a high proportion of their income. Um, so there was a war, but it was leaky. So Lavoisier said, OK, we'll build a non-leaky war. And it's called, it was called the enceinte des fermiers généraux, the, 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 uh, the lock-in of the farmer, farmer's general. Some bits of it are still there, and you can see it. It's a good 30 feet high. There's no way you could get over it. You couldn't smuggle stuff in. And there were a number of uh, toll gates, two of which still remain very extremely noble buildings, um, through which people had to pay. And this led to uproar. And in fact, on the 13th of July, 1789, the mob really got going, and they burned down 
They, they burned down the toll gates and they demolished part of the wall. And that really is the date that the French should be celebrating, because that was the seminal moment of the revolution. The next day, which was the Bastille, of course, that was a bit of street theater. They only, uh, they only uh, released four people, two of whom were insane, one of whom was the Marquis de Sade, who'd been, <laughs> who'd been imprisoned by his family on the grounds of sexual excess. Um, and, but somehow they chose that day. I don't know why. The, uh, the 13th would have been much more, much more appropriate. So Lavoisier was very much involved in that. But given his due, he used his enormous fortune to do science. And he did not just chemistry, he did all kinds of things. He was very, very involved, for example, in farming. He realized that the land system in France were people didn't own their land, mo mostly, uh, was completely hopeless. They couldn't afford to put down fertilizer. So he, built, he bought an enormous estate in near Paris, and he did chemistry on it. He measured how much nitrogen he put on the land, how much weight his animals put, uh, put on, how much money he got out of the crops, and he made, you know, he was the first scientific agriculturalist. So he was a remarkable man. And, and of course, the other sort of, um, uh, I, mean, I mean, the full quote from the, the judge is that, um, we have no need for geniuses. The progress of the revolution cannot be impeded. Yeah. And, of course, all of us can think of, you know, Soviet Russia and these things um, uh, repeat themselves. And also, of course, the other thing which is, in, in a sense, poignant about Lavoisier is that within a year, the New Republic was mortified to have lost the great man and, you know, they were begging his wife for forgiveness. Um, I want to talk about the person in the centre, Steve, just to link us to someone else I want to ask you about, just because one of the things that is really really vivid in your book is, is, is the violence. I mean, I know we all kind of study the French Revolution, but uh, uh, it's the old joke, isn't it, that one death is a tragedy and many deaths is a, t a statistic. Mm. And I feel particularly sorry for the chap in the middle, Malizade, who was you know, a distinguished botanist, he'd retired to his estate. He decided, out of goodness of heart, to defend Louis XVI at his trial. And the prize for this was to watch his daughter, son-in-law, and all his grandchildren be executed before he was also executed. So uh, not a good choice, maybe, for him. But, but it leads on to someone else that we and I have talked about, which is the great mathematician Condorcet. Yeah. Um, and uh, the particular picture I have there is something that is one of the great parts of the um, Musée des Arts Métier collection, which is this wonderful idea of um, the decimal world, yeah. but, but Condorcet himself has a great personal story and also a fascinating range of interests. Yes, I mean, he was a, he was a mathematician. He was uh, at the foundation of the metric system, um, and they wanted to rationalize the uh, system of measurement, because, and there, there were all kinds of systems of measurement di in different places. What tended to happen a lot in France, and of course happened also in Britain, was that you would buy stuff, corn, let's say, with one system of weights, and then the merchants would use a different system of weights to sell it. And of course, that was always strongly uh, biased towards the merchants. Um, and this varied enormously from place to place. So the French Revolution, which was overwhelmingly one of order and rationalism, set out to rationalize this. Now, th what they wanted to do was to set out a universal measure of length. So what did they decide to do? And you th what, you, what they decided actually was completely arbitrary. It was just as arbitrary as, a, as what we call the toys, uh, which was that distance between the outstretched arms of Henry the Fourth. Henry the Fourth was it? I can't remember. Uh, that was an arbitrary distance, but that was the one they based had been based on. They decided to measure the distance between the North Pole and the equator through Paris, needless to say, um, and to use one ten millionth of that as the meter. Now, that's a completely arbitrary measure, but they actually did it. They sent expeditions up to northern Finland and down to Peru and measured the shape of the Earth, which was indeed flattened at the top. Well, the Cassinis, actually, who were the, who were the great um, map makers, they didn't believe it was flattened. And Voltaire, when he discovered that it was, he was sent to, sent to Condorcet, you have flattened the Earth and the, and the Cassinis. Um, uh, <laughs> um, but uh, they did this, and they, they did a survey of France. And the survey of France was the first large-scale survey of any country in the world as part of this. You know, that was the level of, of um, competence and enthusiasm which they had. But isn't there a wonderful story? Um, I can't remember if it's Louis the Fourteenth or Fifteenth getting quite cross with all this, because at one stage when there was a more yeah. accurate measurement of France, um, they discovered it was 100 kilometers smaller. Yeah. And he yeah. famously yeah. said, you've... I've lost more territory due to science than I have due to war. Yes, he had. He <laughs> did, yeah. Yes, yeah, yeah. yes they, 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 were, they vastly over, had overestimated the width of France. 
Um, they, me they measure distance in terms of days, um, of, of journey time. And uh, he measured that France was seven days across and eight days north to south. Um, and shows how good the roads were. And coming back to Condorcet, I mean, I mean, what's so interesting about him is that I mean, he was absolutely uh, one of the central figures in you know, the new thinking in, in, in the New Republic. And I, you said to me earlier, which I hadn't realized, that a great advocate for, of rights for women. Yes, he was. Condorcet has a, a phrase which is a very modern one, and I can't remember it exactly, but he says, in effect, that he should never, you, never claim that there were intrinsic differences among, pe among people, because to do so was using biology as an alibi for political inequality. Okay. And that's a very noble feeling. It isn't, in fact, correct, I have to say. Uh, but as part of that, he was an advocate of, for vo votes for women. Um, and now we're talking 1789, and that's pretty damn early to be doing that. And he didn't succeed. Um, but the, uh, the irony is, of course, what genetics has done, my own subject, um, indeed into, uh, has done to sport as much as anything else, um, is to discover that that's not true. Because in fact, if you look at, to return to Lavoisier for a moment, if you look at uh, Lavoisier's metabolic measurements, if you are doing extreme sport, shall we say, running the marathon, um, that there, biological inequality is at the center of the whole system. Because um, d all 25 top marathon runners in the world for the last 10 years have been Africans. Um, there's one group called the Kalenjin who live in the high mountains of Kenya, who are, I forgot what the figure is, they're 0.2% of the world population, and they're 10% of the world's top marathon runners. Why is this? It's because of biology. They have, they've lived up there in those high mountains for many years. Um, uh, there are environmental effects, because their when their mother's a, when a, a, a person's mother is pregnant, um, uh, the fetus gets a much bigger heart, a much more blood vessels. They run to school, and if you've ever worked in Africa, which I have on several occasions, it's a very nice thing to see young children running enthusiastically five or six miles to school, um, often downhill, and then uphill and back again. But they have biological differences. They, they're hot, they have genes which allow them to soak up more oxygen. Over, they have a lower metabolic rate, so they don't heat up more. And oh, they have the Kalenjin, a famously very, very long spindly arms and legs, um, which, uh, which means they lose heat. So they win the marathon for biological reasons, which, which, uh, which Condorcet would have, would have hated. But you can't, dis you, can't, you can't simply dismiss this fact. You have to ask what you, what you do about it. And the answer is, I don't know the answer, but Condorcet was certainly right. So all this talk of uh, marathons makes me think of food, which leads rather beautifully into this fabulous picture yeah. of um, Parmentier. Parmentier. Yeah. Um, and you know, many of us have think, oh yes, that sounds vaguely familiar. Surely I've, I've eaten something with that name. But I mean, I mean, you talk about Parmentier as you know one of the great um, uh, experimenters with potato, um, and an extraordinary period where, I mean, on a very practical level, a nation needs to be able to feed itself. Yeah. I mean, Parmentier is an ex extraordinary character. He had been taken prisoner in one of the many Franco-Prussian wars um, and had been imprisoned uh, in, uh, in, 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 uh, in Prussia. And uh, he'd been fed, he was fed on only, effectively on only one item, which is potatoes, which were completely unknown in France. And they were unknown in France, and indeed in Britain they were scarcely eaten at the time, um, for various reasons. First of all, they're not mentioned in the Bible. Okay? You, don't eat, you don't want to eat anything that isn't mentioned in the Bible. Um, secondly, they grow underground, uh, embarrassingly close to the devil himself. Um, thirdly, they're wrinkled, therefore they cause leprosy. Okay? And they had, a, they had all kinds of strange myths about them. There's a, a line in Shakespeare's Merry Wives of Windsor, which has puzzled Shakespearean scholars for many years, um, Falstaff in this rather secondary play of Shakespeare, um, uh, persuades himself quite wrongly that he's managed to uh, argue two women into bed with him. And he, just as he's about to take advantage of this uh, happy event, which of course they're just mocking him, he raises his eyes to the firmament and he says, let the sky rain potatoes. <laughs> and many learned works have been written by Shakespeareans about that. Potatoes were thought to be aphrodisiacs in those days. Okay? <laughs> they were, um, I can tell you I've eaten plenty of chips <laughs> without much obvious effect. But, but Lavoisier, uh, anyway, Parmentier ate the potato, and he stayed healthy. 
And he realized, this is extraordinary. I'm eating this one thing. And they knew, they didn't know about vitamins, but they knew if you only ate one food, you were unlikely to survive. But potatoes, you survived on. And so he brought it into France. And he did it. Um, the, the revolution, actually, said that people must eat potatoes. And in the gar gardens of the Luxembourg, uh, which are now beautiful former gardens, for a couple of years, all the flowers were purple. Why were they purple? They were potato plants. And what, uh, what, uh, what Parmentier did, uh, or so it is said, mm. was to put guards on these plants during the day because they were so valuable. And then the people would look at them and say, oh, look, what's, all, what's all this about? And people didn't want to eat potatoes. But then the guards were taken away at night. And allegedly, of course, the peasants would then creep in and steal the potatoes because they must be valuable. So they started growing them and realized they were the ideal, the ideal um, uh, foodstuff and spread all through France, through Ireland. And of course, that too, for biological reasons, ended in disaster because they were planting the same variety of potato, the same one as in Ireland indeed. And in 1853, there was the potato blight, which, uh, 1848 first, and then 1853, there was the potato blight, which of course led to disaster in Ireland, but also in France, and to the revolution of 1848. And the revolution of 1848 was the one when Karl Marx writes, he wrote a book about the revolution of 1848, and it, the famous phrase is that history always repeats itself. The first time is tragedy, the second time is farce. And the tragedy was 1789, the farce was 1848. I have to say my own first visit ever to Paris was in 1968, May 1968, and I was on my way down to the Pyrenees where I spent much of my life, scientific life, uh, now I'm ashamed to say I have a house there, spent much of my time there, um, to collect snails. And uh, I came from Edinburgh, where it, was May 19, where it was May 1958 in those days, as I remember. Um, um, <laughs> and I see chilly Edinburgh, got down to the Gare du Nord, and uh, walked into the streets of Paris, and I thought, my God, what is this place? It's amazing. But I didn't really have any time. I had to get the, I had to get the, uh, the, um, the uh, metro, which I took to the Gare Oosterlitz, I think it was. And I got into the metro, and I was uh, chugging along, and those noisy old metros, and I thought, strange, they all wear perfume here. Well, we've heard about the French people, they all wear perfume, poof. Um, and, but it's all, it's, it's slightly strange perfume, it wasn't unpleasant, it was a bit pungent. And I got out and I got the train down to the south, and uh, I was reading an English newspaper the following day, it turned out it was tear gas, there had been a big riot <laughs> that day, and it had, it had sunk down into the metro. And that, of course, was the real history repeating itself as fast, because that went absolutely nowhere. Well, uh, we've got, uh, if, well, thinking of um, uh, fast, we should just, um, little, one little loose end I forgot to mention, just briefly about Condorcet, which is that uh, his story does not end happily, of course, um, because uh, he was either murdered or committed suicide. Yeah, um, let me just um, move on. I'm not, uh, perhaps the history of balloons is rather well known, but I'm going to skip across this, but I do just want to remind myself of a wonderful quotation which maybe is well known, but I didn't know, which is um, when the vast crowd were watching the great um, demonstrations in 1783, someone turning to Benjamin Franklin and saying, what's the point of a balloon? To which he replied, what's the point of a newborn baby? Yes. Which I think is a wonderful retort. Um, yes. I want to talk about um, uh, Laplace, yes. uh, who you mentioned earlier, uh, for two reasons. I mean, I mean, the first, which I had not realized, is that um, I mean, he actually thrived after the revolution, yeah. and um, famously one of his pupils at the Ecole Militaire was Napoleon, he was, yeah. who, who felt some devotion towards him. Yes. I mean, the pastor again was one of these extraordinary figures. Um, he wrote a book, he was an astronomer, a mathematician, and um, <coughs> he said there were only, there were only um, five people in the world who could understand his mathematics, and only one woman. And this, the woman was Mary Somerville, who founded Somerville College in... Cambridge, is it? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and she translated Oxford, the book. Oxford, Oxford. Oxford, Oxford yeah. that's right, Oxford. Um, and, but Laplace said, Celestial Mechanics, which I've tried to read, is way above my head mathematically. Um, it's a remarkable book because he put forth the idea, and the revolutionary ideas are there, is that there was a perfect order in the universe. And that he says, I can't remember again the quote, I'll remember the quote in general, that if we understand the position of every object in the universe today, we will predict the exact position of every object in the universe forever in the future. And he, he did some remar had some remarkable insights. He writes in one paragraph of his book, I could imagine a planet so great, so big, 
that the power of gravity is enough to stop light escaping from it. Now, that's pretty damn good for 1790. Um, that's the black hole. I mean, he was wrong about the size, but he had the idea of black holes. Um, and um, uh, Napoleon famously, Napoleon was a mathematician, and he was a, a, quite a capable mathematician. He started off as a gunnery officer, you know, and he said, actually, towards the end of his life, if I had not been a soldier and conquered the world, I would have been a scientist and explained it. Um, um, they've, not, they've never, never been famous for their uh, modesty, the French nation, I have to say. Um, but it, it is said, and the phrase I often use, a term I often use about Laplace, it is said that Laplace, knowing on what side his bread was buttered, uh, dedicated Celestial Mechanics to, to Napoleon. And Napoleon supposedly read it, and he came up to Laplace and he said, why is there no mention of God in this book? And Laplace came out with a great phrase, for us, which is very useful for us uh, scientific atheists. And Laplace said, I have no need for that hypothesis. <laughs> and, that, and that's a wonderful phrase, because that yes. really takes the, the line, which I think every scientist should take, is you do not need God. You might, if you wish to believe in God, by all means do. Interestingly enough, what he really meant was that Newton needed God. Because Newton had worked out the laws of the universe, gravity and all that stuff, but he couldn't understand how he got started. You know, why did things start spinning around and so on? And that was God. God had given it a whoosh, shove and, the, and uh, the universe had started. And Laplace was saying his theory didn't need that. So I want to um, uh, go back to something you, you mentioned earlier, which, which is um, uh, a Darwin. Uh, and you mentioned Lamar, but also a, a couple of things I wanted to ask you about. I mean, you mentioned something very striking, which is in the first edition of The Origins of Species. Um, Darwin gives fulsome praise to a very large number of French scientists. Yes. Um, and uh, you know, many of them are now not known, but Lamarck is one of them. The, the person I really want to ask you about, because um, in, in a weird way, he is ex exceptionally fascinating, which is the Comte de Buffon, mm -hmm. who, as you were, was head of the Royal Gardens, and as you say in the book, famously extremely prosperous, which is code for very fat. Um, <laughs> but, but he's interesting, I think, for two reasons. One is because he gives me hope. So he started life as a lawyer, then decided to become a statistician, then he decided he did do a few works on logic, and then suddenly becomes a botanist, I mean, in a way that's sort of inconceivable now. But the, the real question I want to ask you is this. So from the way you describe his theories, it's, he fascinates me because whilst he was totally wrong, actually he was on to something about how active selection is. Yes. So he, as, as I understand it, Steve, he took very much the view that ever since the Greek um, uh, world, we've been in permanent decline because without active selection, everything becomes gray and second rate. Uh, and, and you know, Lamarck takes the opposite view, which is all progress yes. towards inevitable human progress. But, but it is fascinating how um, that Darwin should respect him as a figure despite the apparent yes. absurdity of his theories. Yeah. Well, I mean, his theories did, uh, went a long way. I mean, one of his, co one of his young colleagues uh, did a most extraordinary thing. He went to the, he went to the uh, morgue in Paris and took the most attractive young boys he could find, dead ones, and measured, the, me measured their proportions and compared it with the proportions of Greek statues. And the Greek statues were much more elegant than the French people, so it was decline. And he went further than that because he had a theory which I never really understood, that everything in the new world mm. declined. And Oliver Goldsmith in The Deserted Village you know, uh, talks about these people who have had to abandon their village and they go, in fact, to America where no birds sing. And, uh, and Buffon, for no reason at all, believed that everything in America went downhill, including the humans, okay. Now, uh, Thomas Jefferson, who was a very considerable naturalist and scientist in his own right, was infuriated by this. And so he had some correspondence with Buffon. And in the end, to prove that this wasn't right, he sent Buffon a stuffed moose. Um, um, and in fact, it turns out that the famous stuffed moose was a bit of a was a bit of a fake because it was bits of several large mooses which had been put together. And Buffon saw this stuffed moose and said, "I am wrong about the moose," um, because that was much bigger than any European surveyed. Um, but unfortunately, he died before he could write the letter of apology. <laughs> but, but, but the reason I, there's a wonderful phrase in your book that I wonder if you could say something about, which is although. Uh, you know, B Buffon's view was an, uh, that unless you know wise people like him intervened, we'd all become grey and 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 
you know, decline. But there's a wonderful phrase you use in the book, which is that you talk about the constant vigilance of natural selection. And so at the heart of his strange ideas is a rather fundamental concept, which maybe is what Darwin really valued in him. Yes, I think. Well, I mean, Buffon was the great naturalist. I mean, his, he, his book, Natural History, um, was the best-selling book in Europe for about 10 years. And it's, uh, it's now worth it's huge. It's, it's a multi, multi-volume book. Every learned, every, every, every uh, educated person across the whole of Europe had a copy of this book. And it, it's beautifully illustrated. And we're now worth vast quantities of money. Um, so he was a zoologist in the traditional, st what I call stamp collecting sense. You know, he, he described dozens and dozens of species of, of animal. Um, but he did come up with the idea of, of, of what Darwin had a, has a chapter in The Origin about relic organs. Uh, you know, organs which are no longer of utility, which then begin to accumulate, as we would now call it, uh, mutations, genetic errors. And that comes straight from Buffon. Mm. Um, I'm just conscious of that I want some time for questions from the audience, but let, let's uh, finish with, with, with this. So um, one of the interesting things that you talk about in the book is um, the foundation of the French equivalent of the Royal Society a few years after the Royal Society. Um, uh, very much set up with a, a, a practical uh, uh, need. Uh, Colbert, the you know, finance yeah. minister to uh, the king, was very keen on that. And, and I'm particularly struck by um, uh, René Raimeau, who you, you mentioned, famously uh, the founder of the temperature scale before Celsius yeah. uh, became the, the chosen one. Um, and, and you talk in the book about this absolutely enormous, probably the greatest catalogue ever, of useful inventions. Yeah, think, uh, and yeah. it's interesting that link then to this extraordinary group of scientists by the end of the 18th century. Yes, that, that was a big difference. I mean, uh, the, the Royal Society was founded as a gentleman's club. Um, and to join this club, you had to uh, you know, be elected and uh, pay a, a fairly substantial subscription, says he rather bitterly, every year. Um, <laughs> where, whereas the, uh, the, the, the Academy Royale de, in, 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 pa in Paris, which is Louis XV, um, was exactly the opposite, because if you were elected to the academy in Paris, you received a substantial salary. So there were very good reasons to be elected to the academy. Um, and, uh, and Colbert, who was uh, Louis's uh, finance minister, did this for the purest of motives. He wanted technical advance. That's what the academy in Paris was set up for. And it was told to, look, to test various inventions, uh, some of which were completely bizarre, one of which was... Um, uh, the two I remember were, one was a system of ships with springs on the bottom, so that if they ever hit a rock, they'd bounce off it. That one didn't <laughs> win. And the other one was a, a primitive telegraph system where they'd have a series of cannons along the, along, the, uh, along the countryside, and you put your message in a cannonball, it'll be fired to the next cannon and then to the next cannon. Um, but, uh, of course, the telegraph itself was then invented at just this time. Uh, and that's the big difference between the two. And the Arte Métier, which was the, uh, the, the document you yeah. talk about, I've forgotten how many volumes it is. It's actually 130. Yeah, 130 volumes on paper making, on mining, on leather, on making leather. Sega, oh, so the guy who, who worked on opium, and had also been the man who did the experiment with Lavoisier, he made an extraordinary fortune out of inventing a way to tan leather at the time of the Napoleonic Wars. People have been tanning leather for years. They had no idea how it worked. Or it took them months to tan a hide. He had a method which did it in a week, and he became fantastically rich, as did many others of these people. And I have to say, not many scientists in Britain have managed, ever managed to succeed to do that. You also make the rather witty point um, that uh, uh, as um, you know, the new uh, republic came into being, that it was quite a, a difficult um, choice for scientists between being a senator and a scientist, mm. because uh, you know politicians were astonishingly well paid, yes, yes. and so those, scient those scientists who could also be members of the Senate had a very nice did, existence. Ah, oh, the French get it right. <laughs> but let me ask you: the, re the reason I have a street sign up is one of the things I said to you earlier is that you know I get. Paris a lot for work and, and pleasure and suddenly I've been revisiting my time in Paris suddenly struck by how many street names okay. are named after scientists oh, yeah. uh, and engineers um, and, and, and you were saying to me which I thought was was quite funny you know one thinks of uh, Paris as a city of you know visual arts and music but actually as commemorated in its streets, is a city of scientists. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it, interestingly enough, the Rue, the Rue Darwin is a little tiny back alley in the suburbs. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Um, yeah, so I'm, I, I talk quite a lot, and I won't, I'll, we, need, we need to stop in a moment, but I talk quite a lot about the, about the, the Eiffel Tower, which of course was erected as a, as a monument to, uh, to the centennial of the, of the revolution. And if you stand on the, high, on the higher um, uh, platform there, you can actually point out these a astonishing mm -hmm. places um, where these discoveries, the speed of light, all this kind of stuff, the, the potato, um, the very first genetics was done in Versailles, uh, you, can, you could really could have a scientific bus tour of Paris. So if you want to make a great deal of money and speak French, I suggest you set one up. <laughs> Excellent. Well, there we are. That's a wonderful um, gauntlet thrown down. Um, now, we have some time for some questions from the, from the audience. I don't know if there's a hand just over there, a man in a blue shirt just, just behind you. Hi. Uh, one person who you haven't mentioned at all is Jean-Paul Marat, who, uh, and I, who rather oddly was a scientist before the revolution exactly. and became so consumed with politics he sort of gave it up. And I just wondered if you had anything to I, say I about I do him. have a chapter about Marat. Uh, Marat, of course, is famous, famous for being the, the subject of a painting, another painting by David, by David yeah. which, is, uh, which is him lying in his bath being stabbed by, having been stabbed by Charles Corday. And Marat was a bizarre, extraordinary character. Um, and because Marat saw him, he was a doctor, and he, saw, and he saw himself as a scientist, as an important scientist. And he'd, all, he'd been a political agitator in, in France before the revolution, and he was forced to flee. And uh, as one naturally would, he fled to Newcastle on Tyne. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, and uh, he, w he went to Newcastle, and then he moved to London. He set up a chemist shop in Soho. And I've, never looked, I've looked for Marat, the chemist, never found it. Um, but he wrote two essays in English when he was in London, um, both of which were rather sensible bits of work, scientific bits of work. One of which was called a treatise on gleets. And gleets, gleets were uh, urinary tract infections, venereal diseases. And he had some mechanism which was supposed to treat them, which is at least less damaging than the other methods. And another one was on, on the treatment of a singular disease of the eyes. And this was ch uh, children having inflamed eyes, which they used to paint mercury on, which was a disastrous mistake. Um, and so he did these. He wrote, wrote these, and he had a good. He had an idea. He wrote to the University of St Andrews. I don't know why he chose it, um, saying, "Could he get an honorary degree?" And the university he got a degree, a PhD. And the university said, "Oh yes, you can, as long as you, sell, as long as you sell, send us the fee." So he sent them the fee. And Dr Johnson, the great uh, lexicographer, on hearing this, said, "The university." gets richer by degrees. <laughs> <laughs> and, and of course, in this, these days of enormous fees, we're doing it again. But, but also, the other thing about, you mentioned Mara, but the thing that's very interesting about that time, I mean, even Robespierre fancied himself as a bit Absolutely. of a scientist. I mean, I mean, of these 650 members of parliament, not, not many would say, you know, I'm a X, Y, Z, and by the way, I'm a really mean physicist as well. I can tell I you, in the, pre <laughs> in the present parliament, not one would say that. Yeah. There are no scientists in parliament. There was one in the previous parliament. Yeah. yeah. Um, gentleman there, just in the middle. Is that context? Uh, one, one, one second. The microphone's on its way. In that context, Steve, I was interested that you endorsed Will, uh, Winston Churchill's maxim that yeah. scientists should be on tap rather than on top. And I can understand from Margaret Roberts that that, that may well be good evidence for that, uh, for that particular view. And yet, when you look at the, th bringing us up to the present day, when you look at the really important political issues that affect us all in the world, be it environmental change, species degradation, how to control our own genetic futures, they're all questions at which science ought to be central. And yet, I'm appalled at the ignorance amongst our politicians, both here and, as far as I can see, on the continent as well, at the level of scientific knowledge, uh, more, more understanding, I think, um, amongst the politicians today in the House of Commons and, 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 and elsewhere. Do you yes. not think, I mean, I'm not asking for research scientists to have political um, uh, responsibilities, but I think we, I would want to argue, I think, for a greater... Um, uh, level of scientific knowledge amongst our ordinary politicians and try to encourage current day scientists who are not going to make a, a yeah. research career out yeah. of science to go into politics. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a, there's a subtle point. I mean, I think science, scientific advice is very, very important. And uh, I mean, in the States, Thomas Jefferson and so on, where they, they took scientific advice, and they, and which isn't always correct, needless to say. And of course, during the Second World War, British science really helped win, win, the, win the war. There's no question of it. Um, that's different from having scientists who have a political agenda and feel that somehow their agenda is driven by science. I think that's a big mistake. Um, I think I should also say, in, in, 
in acknowledgement to the Royal Society, is that the Royal Society is very active in this field. It has a, it has a lot of interaction with government. Um, uh, Lord Sainsbury, who was the previous science minister, uh, was very, very interested and very well informed about science, and he's been sidelined now. Um, but I think th the links are there, and I think they should be there. You can argue, I think you could, uh, you could uh, I would argue that if you want a fair representation of the population in the House of Commons, you wouldn't have, whatever it is, 77 lawyers and no scientists. In fact, you might have no lawyers and 77 scientists. It would be much better. Um, but, uh, so there is that. But I don't think, I'm, I'm trying to, I think the idea that scientists are politically more sophisticated, let's say, than anybody else, I think that's a mistake. Well, given, given the body count from 1789 yeah. to, to uh, 1794, you might be right. Um, some more, there's a gentleman just there. I see that the, uh, the questioning genes on the Y chromosome, we've discovered this, yeah. I didn't hear you say that any of these great scientific thinkers thought maybe it wasn't necessarily a good idea to execute whole families in, in, a, in a SWAT. I, I, I couldn't agree with you more. The interesting uh, thing is the guillotine um, yeah. was invented as, a, as an act of kindness because the previous methods of, of execution in Britain too have been completely barbarous. I mean, people who uh, were thieves in the southwest towns were boiled alive, that kind of stuff. Um, famously, there was, uh, what was his name? Somebody, was, somebody was, who made an attack on Louis XV when he was a boy, uh, was torn to pieces um, in the Place de la Grève um, in Paris with horses which were in front of the chairs of a crowd. So that the, the guillotine was an attempt to make this a bit less barbarous. Oddly enough, I once went, for other reasons, uh, to the museum... Uh, to, of anatomy in Paris, and I, went, I was behind the scenes there. And they have shelves and shelves of, of casts of heads of guillotined individuals. And one thing really struck me about them, they all share the same facial expression, which is one of extreme irritation. <laughs> <laughs> um, but just dwelling on that, uh, d um, before we move on to the next question, I mean, first of all, you say in the book something you pass over, but you make the point very poignantly, which is that there you know, were serious discussions before the guillotine uh, was accepted of what would have been a, an 18th century version of the gas chamber yes, as a way, a way of dealing with those who opposed the revolution. The other thing you say in the book, which I think is fascinating, just coming back to the gentleman's question, is that about a quarter of the members of the French Royal Academy died, but what's interesting is how they died. So actually the ma majority were not guillotined, but died in the many wars. Well, yes. I mean, several of them were, ki were killed in the wars, um, either fighting or uh, as casualties. Uh, a couple of them committed suicide. Uh, one of them on the on the steps of the guillotine, so he wouldn't uh, he wouldn't be dishonoured. Um, yes, and an awful lot of them were imprisoned and just, uh, had to be banished and so on. So it was a it was a difficult time. Uh, another question. Almost at seven thirty. Should we just get the microphone to you? Just. Here in the second row. Uh, this is two questions. One is an audio question. Did you say there was a questioning gene, and was that a joke? Well, I say, I, it's, uh, when I, it's very strange when uh, I tend to find, if you go to an audience, at UCL while I work, if you ask for any questions, it's always the women who ask the questions. Um, in general, with a, slightly more, um, with a slightly more mature audience, it's always the men. Um, that's why I say the questioning gene is on the Y chromosome. Uh, well, well, my a original question was an e a UCL question, which was, were you friendly with Eric Hobsbawm? Uh, yes, I was, strangely, yes. And do you not feel that he's in this book in some rather lovely way? S say again? Do you not feel that Eric is somehow in your book yes, in a rather so I, lovely I, I, I way? I have to say, I knew Hobsbawm quite well, not, not particularly through UCL, but because of the hay, the hay, hay in book festival, where he always was. Uh, I see him a lot. Um, and... Um, uh, that hadn't struck me. I hadn't, the overlap hadn't struck me. Yes, that's true. I should have, I should have taken more out of that. I read the, his, his Revolution book. Uh, uh, damn. Second edition. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, well, it's 7.30. I think we should finish there. As you can probably tell, I'm a great fan of the book. I urge you to read it because it's beguiling. And as you can see, Steve uh, portrays a fantastic picture of the period of the Revolution, but also the birth of the New Republic and great links to modern science and show the great connectedness of, of, of things. Um, and I, I should also uh, say that in addition to um, bringing uh, to London an exhibition about French science, as it happens, the 
the Science Museum has one of the greatest collections in the world of scientific instruments from the 17th and 18th century, and we're going to build a new gallery to put them on display in conjunction with the Royal Society, which, as you know, also has great uh, collections. Alas, we've not really had the time to talk about the other side of the channel. And one of the other interesting questions, I think, which is that, as you know, scientists have an amazing ability to correspond despite war and revolution. And the degree of connection between uh, the French uh, scientific community and the British one is perhaps a subject for another day. But, Steve, can I thank you? And I look forward to my um, personal copy of the Lady Bird Book of Evolution um, <laughs> with a fulsome dedication, and I'm sure it will um, change my life. But seriously, um, uh, your, book is, your book is wonderful, as indeed all your, your work in public engagement is. And so can we thank Steve? <laughs> <laughs>